I'd just like to really thank Mario Bazzini, obviously, for inviting me to talk and his organising committee. It's such a great event to be here, and so many people, it's just amazing. So, well done, give yourselves a pat on the back. Um, you've really done a great job, and hopefully um, the audience will get something out of this today as well. Radio. I also love Switzerland. This is um, my first trip here, which is amazing, because I've been to Europe a few times, but I actually haven't been to Switzerland before. And we have a lot in common. I'm actually a New Zealander, so I've actually, um, this is my home stomping ground back in central Otago. This is Lake Wanaka, and um, this is where I you know, climb mountains and hike and fly hang gliders and things like that. So coming to Switzerland, it's very similar. It's like being home, which is great. And the people are pretty cool, too. It's pretty laid back like Kiwis, so that's really cool. So thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Obviously, I am now working in central Queensland, as you can see there. It's sort of um, a big island in, in between the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. And I'm sort of round, <laughs> round about halfway up the Queensland coast there. Um, however, I notice there's a bit of rivalry between the Scandinavian countries here today. And of course, there always is lots of rivalry between Australians and New Zealanders, and you'll see that as well. So when I told my friends I was moving to Australia, one of them who's here in the audience today sent me a map of Australia, which is probably more accurate than this one. So, <laughs> quite a few nasty things that can, can, can kill you in Australia, of course. And luckily, I just happen to live just between the man-eating koalas and the poisonous steak, so I'm actually OK. And then talking to my Danish colleagues last night, it's actually the ants which are the worst things. So, yeah, it's a great place to live if you can, you know, survive it. <laughs> Rightio, so how do I get onto the topic of concussion? Well, I've been doing it for a little while now, probably 10 or 15 years, I guess, to a certain degree. And this is the SCAT-3, which you may be aware of, you may not to. Um, we're going to talk about it a little bit more as we go on. But in the last, I guess, five or so years, this is the stuff that we've been working on. So this is our work from the University of Otago and the University of Melbourne in particular. And um, basically looking at balance and coordination and how we can use those on the sideline to identify someone who's got a concussion. We've also been working a little bit lately on symptom evaluation, which is a, a minefield, to tell the truth. And this is how we actually diagnose or return to play athletes quite often on their symptomology. So I'll talk about that a little bit today as well. Um, when Mario asked me to talk about return to play and concussion, I went, oh my goodness, you know, really? In the olden days, this is how we used to decide on whether an athlete went back to, to play or not, you know? Crystal ball gauging to a certain degree, and certainly before 2000, because things certainly changed after 2000. We also had some pretty average treatments in the olden days as well, and so I think now, probably these days, obviously in here in Bern, uh, with the tick-tock of the Swiss technology, we're probably actually coming to a, a really good time in concussion. Obviously, it's getting a lot of media coverage, and um, obviously, um, we're actually doing a reasonably good job at understanding it a little bit more than we used to. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So the overview today, quite a lot, and because I talk fast and I talk in a funny English language, uh, as a, a dialect, I'm going to put all my words up there so you can actually follow it and read it. So we're going to talk about why concussion is a problem. We're going to talk about return to play after concussion and the concerns we have for it and risk management. We're going to talk about the five R's of concussion. And we're going to talk about using return to play protocols after concussion in the olden days, what we used to do. So you know not to use it now because it's not so good anymore. So we know what to do now. And we know about management and return to play after acute concussion. Factors, obviously, to consider um, based on symptomology because that's how we tend to send them back and management and RTP of persistent concussion, which is a bit of an issue for some people, and the classification and treatment of post-concussion disorders. So hopefully, I'll get through that in half an hour. Obviously, um, this is Macquarie et al., uh, the latest consensus statement, of course, um, and it just tells you there that obviously concussion is a transient brain injury, defined as a complex pathophysiological process, and obviously induced by bi biomechanical forces. So you know that already. Um, really, it's not a, a structural injury, it's a functional injury, and so it's actually a neurometabolic cascade that occurs. You get uh, the release of glutamate, which becomes a toxin, obviously releases a lot of calcium into the brain, and calciums um, cause degeneration in the brain, which is not good. Um, and then you have, obviously, a decrease in cerebral blood flow as well, so not so much blood there helping out. And so you tend to have a little bit of a brain energy crisis. You know, you want to heal, but you're not able to heal to a certain degree. And so that lasts for a certain period of time, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Obviously, with sport, we also need to be concerned about the fact that not all concussions are concussions. They may manifest at, as a concussion to start with, but they can be actually quite serious head injuries. And so we need to make consideration that actually that they may not have a concussion. They actually might have a, um, um, you know, a subarachnoid hematoma or contusion or whatever you want to call it. So we need to always be aware of that, that it may not be that. 
And of course, there's long-term consequences now that we're starting to realize a little bit more with the, um, the chronic traumatic encephalopathy and things like that, which are now allowing the NRL to, to, um, to um, reach a consensus deal or concussion deal with regard to you know, three, billion, three, and qu three quarters of a billion dollars or so. Um, they're coming to grips with that. So there's long-term consequences associated with concussion as well. These are things I wrote down the other day when I was thinking about doing this talk. I thought, what do you need to know about return to play? It's not that simple, really. You need to know a lot about a lot of things. You need to be able to assess the pathology appropriately. You need to differentially diagnose between that and a subarachnoid hematoma. You need to look at appropriate and targeted management for that athlete, relative rest, graded rehabilitation. I threw in optimal loading, because I think that's going to be a, a big theme coming up in the next couple of years. Um, in one of these conferences, so I threw that in, but it's important. How much exercise do you give them? You need to monitor their recovery. You need risk reduction strategies so it doesn't happen again. You need appropriate education and counselling if they can't continue, or you counsel them that they've, you know, that's the end of the career or end of season because they've had too many concussions. And there's obviously the most important thing, which is medical clearance to get back to play. So, all in a nutshell, the probably the easiest thing for you guys to remember is what we used to call the four R's by Kissick and Johnson, which we now call the five R's. And this is the one I prefer, the one on the right. So looking at recognizing a concussion, removing the player from the field or the court, referral to an appropriate medical specialist, uh, rest and return to play. So if you can remember those five things, I think you're doing okay. Of course, it wasn't always this way, and this is that chap again that we saw before. So prior to 2000, Obviously, this is the sort of stuff that we were doing. And it wasn't necessarily wrong. It was just that we didn't have the accurate information at the time. So there were many grading systems around the world. And this is just one of them, Bob Cantu's system, basically, which graded on loss of consciousness and amnesia. Now, we know that not everyone who has a concussion loses consciousness or has amnesia. So obviously, they would be graded as a grade one. But then you have grade twos based on time limits. And based on those time limits associated with those pathologies or those symptoms and signs, um, you would have a mandated time of return to play, one week in the case of a grade two, or uh, if you had uh, two concussions in a series, then you would actually have a month off sport. Now then, um, obviously, um, with taking people back to sport too quickly, um, we have some issues. Obviously, there's a risk of subsequent concussions and what we call now overlapping concussions, which can cause uh, continuing problems or prolonged recovery in that case. Um, we can also have, as I said before, the old term for that was Athletica Pugilistica, which is now CTE, which you see in the, the media a lot more these days. And also the enigma of second impact syndrome, of course, which was always told to players that if you have one injury, one concussion, A, you're more susceptible to have another one, which is true, but the second one could be catastrophic, meaning you could die. Um, I don't actually believe there is actually a, a, a condition called second impact syndrome. It's contentious, I know. But I think what more, happen, what more likely happens is that you have a diffuse cerebral swelling or a subdural hematoma, which just takes time to act. And then the player obviously collapses. Now, we were talking before, we were listening before to Marie, and she was saying, make sure we don't catastrophize. Um, I don't necessarily agree with her, because it's really hard to stop players going back on the field after they had a concussion, particularly if they haven't lost consciousness. So quite often I'll tell them the story, even though I don't believe in it necessarily, I'll tell them the story about second impact syndrome. How, if you've had one concussion, if you go back on that field, you could have another concussion, you could die, or something worse, I'll tell them. So, <laughs> so sometimes catastrophizing is quite useful, I find, for certain athletes who are hell-bent on getting back onto the court or the field, that you can actually give them this, this scenario. Um, and obviously, you know, benign subarachnoid cysts may be the cause of some of our younger athletes who have mild head injuries who actually then have catastrophic results to it, but that's another story. So before 2000, obviously, these are the stories we were telling people with regard to return to play, but it all changed, I guess, with the international, the first conference on concussion, and that happened in Vienna, and obviously there's been subsequent ones in Prague and two in Zurich most recently. So the first one was quite groundbreaking. It revised the definition of sports-related concussion, uh, recognised the limitations of using um, a loss of consciousness or amnesia as um, ways of guiding return to play. And also, um, the duration of clinical severity could not really be delimited um, from the initial presentation. There was really limited correlation between the two. And the good thing about this one is that it actually started stopping players from going back on the day and perhaps having more catastrophic um, consequences associated with it. Now, this is the SCAT, the original one that came out after the Prague conference. And um, this has obviously been modified a number of times, and we're now up to the third version of this. But as you can see, it looks at symptomology, it looks at uh, memory function, cognitive function, and obviously neurological screening, which has developed since then. 
Now, with management of concussion, which is really important for return to play, obviously the cornerstone is physical and cognitive rest, and it's easier to say than actually do. Certainly you can physically rest, but it's very hard to cognitively rest, so actually getting that compliance with our athletes is very difficult. Um, unless you put them in a padded cell or a padded room with no stimulus, it's very difficult. But we do recommend that still as being the best way. Um, the latest, obviously, consensus statement was in 2012, and I believe there's a conference coming up next year, and I believe that it could be rumoured to be in Berlin in Germany. Um, and we're looking forward to that, because this will be updated, of course, the consensus statement, so all new information will come out, which is great. I've just highlighted Paul McCrory's name there, because he's the lead author on these consensus statements, and he's the chap that I work with in Melbourne on all my studies into concussion, and he's quite a useful guy to have. So this is the SCAT-3 that's out at the moment. We saw about it before. Obviously, symptom evaluation is still quite prominent there, and as I said before, that's how we turn our players to, to sport. Now, the big thing that came out with the last consensus statement was this, a protocol for actually return to play after having an acute or initial concussion, which is pretty useful because we didn't have that before. So it's reasonably groundbreaking, but you've probably seen this all before. I'll walk you through it slowly. It's basically a six-stage or a six-step process, basically, where you start with rest and you work forward with increasing the activity over a, uh, over a period of time. And you have 24 hours between each um, step, and so, for instance, you'd start with no activity, you'd rest the player, they have a concussion on the Saturday, you'd rest them on the Sunday, they'd have cognitive and physical rest, and they wouldn't do anything else, basically. On the Monday, if they were symptom-free, um, at rest, then you would progress them to stage two. Okay. So just looking at that, moving through this, these slides, no activity for one day, as a minimum, of course, and then moving on to light aerobic exercise. So just some simple tasks of walking or swimming or whatever the case may be, just to see how they respond to aerobic exercise, very light, just to increase the heart work as your, as your thing there. And um, obviously, if they still become, uh, remain symptom-free during that light aerobic exercise, then they can progress through to sport-specific exercises, and we're adding movement there, as the objective says, moving on to non-contact training drills, again 24 hours, and obviously full contact practice, but requiring a medical clearance for that to occur. Now if they are symptomatic at any of those levels, then they actually degress one step. So if they can't, um, for instance, probably it's easier to look at this one, if they were actually symptomatic, they had a headache or any other symptoms during non-contact training drills, they would progress back to stage three and they'd lose a day. But theoretically, you could probably get a player back to sport in six or seven days using this return to play protocol. Now, it does have some scientific validation based on some animal studies done some time ago, probably in 1995, um, by Hovda, um, which shows that metabolic cascade, which I was talking about earlier, and shows how it's quite elevated, uh, particularly within the first 24 hours, and then you get that reduction. And those arrows are pointing to that sort of period between seven and ten days where most uh, concussions tend to resolve naturally, and we're talking 85 to 90 percent of concussions actually do so. So as long as they're not too symptomatic, um, you can actually progress through that stage and probably get them back to sport, usually in seven days, all going well. Obviously this model is based on adults, and while the, the um, latest consensus document had a SCAT-3 child, or a child SCAT-3 in it, it still had the same return to play protocol. But I would think um, I would treat my adolescent or my, my children who have concussion as if they were my own, and I'd probably actually delay the return to play. So if we were looking at these, instead of having 24 hours between each stage, I'd probably make it twice as long or three times as long, depending on the symptomology, just to make sure they recovered. But again, that's an arbitrary figure, and you need to decide for yourself. And we said before that return to play is based on symptomology. Now, I was lying in bed this morning at about 7 a.m. and decided to fill one out. So this is how I felt this morning. And this is the problem with working on symptomology. I had a little bit of a headache, OK? And not because of the hospitality of the Swiss physio group at dinner last night. It's because I've got a bit of a man flu and I'm almost dying, OK? So I felt a little bit of pressure in my head. I felt a little bit slowed down at 7 o'clock this morning. I was fatigued and had a little low energy. And obviously, because I flew 32 hours to get here from Australia, uh, I had trouble falling asleep the previous night because I was jet-lagged. I was also sad because when I opened up the window, it was raining. So, um, and of course, I was nervous and anxious because I had to talk to you about all this as well. So you can see how normal daily symptoms associated with normal things, normal daily activities, can actually give you the symptomology which would suggest I'm concussed. So if the patient fills this out in the morning before a game or a practice and they have the symptomology, you have to assume that they could be concussed. So working on symptomology alone is not always that great. 
So the factors you need to consider, of course, when working on symptom-based return to play is the fact that baselines need to be established, and not just one baseline at the, at the start of the season. Really, you need to work on a MUWISI um, recursive model of injury prevention, where you actually monitor them on a, on a continual basis, basically, over a period of time, and you regularly take baselines, not just a one-off thing. Symptoms need to be diagnosed accurately, and obviously you need to ask a few more questions to see if they're associated with any sort of other symptoms, such as a cold or a flu. Um, return to play needs to be individualised. And external factors really actually play a huge part in some of the symptoms that people have on a daily basis. If I asked you in the, in the audience to put up your hand if you've got a mild headache, probably, I don't know, 10% probably would at this stage. We've done some research on this, and we studied 300 uh, university students a couple of years back, um, just getting that published now. But we found that, obviously, their symptomology, their scores on the SCAT, uh, were actually quite high, and they were also correlated very strongly to these three factors, sleep, alcohol, and anxiety, or lack of sleep in the case. So this is the sum of our studies, showing very high correlations between alcohol consumption, um, trouble sleeping, and depression and mental fatigue, so things that students would go through on a normal day when they're studying for exams or things like that. So <laughs> it depends on what university you go to, how much alcohol consumption they have, but I was a rather high one, I must admit. Um, OK, so there's issues to actually understand with regards to return to play. But there's more issues as well. We talked about that most concussions will actually resolve within one week or two weeks in, in a lot of cases, but there are people that get stuck on this level where you actually can't progress them any further. They can't get to three, four or five, and they can't get back to play. So this is a bit of a problem. So as I said before, this is a small percentage, but still reasonable. Um, and this is where um, your cornerstone of management, which is usually physical rest and cognitive rest, isn't really resolving the symptoms, and they're still having symptoms ongoing, and they're resting, and they're not getting any better. Now, this was a, um, an issue of brain injury which came out early in the year, and some of you may have seen it. It's actually a really good issue, um, because it concentrated on concussion, which so many good journals are doing these days. Um, and obviously, um, the management of athletes with subacute concussion, post-concussion syndrome remains controversial, and that was one of the statements given by one of the articles, which I'm going to talk about now. Now, this is out of Barry Willer's group, um, out of uh, New York State University, and they've pretty much put on the, in this paper what we were thinking for a long time with these um, post-concussion type syndrome people who continue to have symptoms from time to time, or ongoing, um, that perhaps there's just not one mechanism for it. There's a number of them. And so they have actually come up with a categorization of actually deciding that it's either a global or a subsystem metabolic problem, and that you can actually subclassify it as being physiological, vestibular, or psychogenic, of course. And of course, these symptoms can overlap, or these syndromes can overlap as well. But we'll walk you through them slowly if I've got time. I've got a few more minutes to actually look at that. So if we look at the physiological PCD, which is considered the global one, this is very similar to what you get with an initial concussion. So that's why you've got those pictures back up there again. You've got that brain in energy crisis that's going on, and it's due to cerebral blood flow. So what you had to start with is still continuing. Um, so athletes may report persistent symptoms, um, similar to the initial assessment, of course, or maybe asymptomatic at rest, but continue to have exacerbation when they start to exercise. And so you can't progress them down that continuum, as we talked about before. Now, these authors and many others before them think perhaps the autonomic nervous system is involved in this problem, and it's actually um, not regulating appropriately and not causing the problem. So with regard to management of this, there is some suggestion there, which is growing in the literature, and obviously there's not a huge amount of empirical evidence, but it's actually growing, as I said before, that it could be um, strategies to improve autonomic nervous system may actually um, help with these people. So particularly exercise, as we know, and we are the exercise professionals as being physiotherapists or physical therapists as well. So this is really important for us to know, that exercise can increase parasympathetic nervous system activity, so that's your rest and digest system, as you know, or decrease sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight, and increase cerebral blood flow. So these are all good things we want with these post-concussion syndrome people. Now, animal models have shown that if you start exercising too soon after a brain injury, that it's deleterious, it actually causes more damage than good. So you shouldn't actually do it within the first number of days, and that's why we do a graduated return and we have rest for the first day or two. But animal models show that 14 to 21 days after a concussion, um, and of course these are animals, remember, um, that it's most beneficial and they'll actually get quite a lot better. The symptoms will decrease. And I don't actually hardly ask mice whether they've got a headache or not, but maybe some of our biochemists or some other scientists can tell me that. Anyway, um, obviously, sub-symptom threshold exercise training may hasten recovery. 
So what we're doing with these people is that we're finding out when their symptoms come on, at what exercise level. We're then, if we look at Letty's work, and it's the same group out of um, New York State, they actually exercise them at 80% of their threshold um, for five or six days a week and once daily, and they found that these people improved. And this study here actually studied athletes and normal people with concussion. They found that the athletes actually improved even better than the normal people. So that's a good thing for us as physical therapists to know that we can be exercising these people and decreasing their symptoms and increasing their return to play um, by giving them sub-threshold exercise. So the evidence is building. Here's the flow diagram out of that study, basically. And so if you follow me down through here, we've got the initial assessment, the secondary assessment, and obviously some sort of exercise test. Now, graded treadmill testing is probably the easiest thing to do in your laboratory or your clinic. Um, obviously, if they have no symptoms on graded treadmill testing, they've got no symptoms at rest, they're starting to recover and they can return to play easier. But here is the differentiation. This is probably important for you to know, to be able to differentially diagnose whether they have one of these three conditions or syndromes. Basically, um, physiological PCD, post-concussion disorder, will actually be exacerbated um, on treadmill testing, um, whereas these two things won't be. So you can, you can exercise these as much as possible, and the patient still come back and say, I've still got a headache, I'm still dizzy, I've still got poor balance. And so grade more um, that you can exercise these people and they get better, but they don't actually get better overall. So this is where the exercise comes in, and this is where other strategies come in, which I'll talk about now. So vestibular ocular, PCD, is characterised by persistent concussion symptoms and impairment caused by that system, of course. And so it involves the vestibular ocular reflex, uh, the vestibular spinal reflex, and all these things are pretty important for normal function. So these people get symptoms of dizziness, obviously gait instability, blurred vision, etc. And vertigo and dizziness can often be due to post-traumatic benign paroxysmal positioning vertigo. And so you might know about that term, and particularly in my physio school, we teach that to the students during our neurological rehabilitation. But this is something that you could do for your athletes if you have that skill. So athletes with this, obviously with isolated this and not other symptoms, can be actually exercised to exhaustion. Um, we can then do vestibular therapy and other activities, vestibular rehabilitation, to actually make them better. And if we feel that they've got um, BPVP, we can actually then give them some candle of three positioning movements. So for, to make you familiar with that again, this is the sort of stuff we do. So again, if you're not trained in it, you probably shouldn't be doing it, but it's not a really hard technique to do. And these people get miraculously better. Um, obviously, um, older people also have problems with um, these candles in the inner ear, and um, they are the most large population for this type of treatment. Okay, and then finally, cervicogenic headache, and that's probably what we're best at to some degree as manual physiotherapists or musculoskeletal physiotherapists, is actually um, looking at these people and making them better. So I think there's a real strong role for physical therapists um, with post-concussion um, disorders actually treating them because we know a lot about all these things as well, exercise, uh, manual therapy for the cervical spine and obviously how to do some vestibular rehabilitation as well. So these athletes often describe impact mechanisms, rapid acceleration, so similar to a whiplash type injury, and this is obviously the differential diagnosis as well for some of these problems. They complain of neck stiffness, fatigue, dizziness, headaches, and things like that. And obviously when you examine them physically, they have hypermobile segments, um, they have muscle spasm, tenderness on the paraspinal segments, etc. So again, common physiotherapy for cervicogenic headaches would be mobilisation, strengthening stabilisation, perhaps proprioception exercises, stretching, cervical retraction, perhaps to aid alignment in the cervical spine, and gaze stabilisation, which we may be able to do as well. So all these things, as I said before, are really useful. So in summary, um, obviously sports-related concussion is currently an inevitable consequence of sports participation. We're not gonna, it's not going to go away quickly, we just need to manage it better and understand it better. All concussions should be treated as potential serious injuries, um, initially, obviously. And um, there are return to play consensus protocols that are available for acute or what we used to term simple concussion as opposed to complex, although that term's gone out of vogue in the latest protocols. And there's starting to actually emerge some protocols for those too hard basket, those difficult cases, those ones that just don't get better. We're actually now able to maybe subclassify them um, and actually treat them more appropriately. And I believe that you guys, physical therapists, physiotherapists, are probably the best people, along with your medical practitioner, who will give them clearance and check for other neurological dysfunction, are the best at returning these athletes to sport after concussion. Now, we do know that the consensus, consensus statement and SCAD are evolving, and um, that they're going to continue to evolve, and we're looking forward to the manifestation next year. 
Um, and obviously the, the return to play protocols will also improve as well. So, I'd just like to thank you for listening and I hope that was of use to you as a physical therapist and you can actually you know, put that into practice when you go back to work on Monday. Thank you very much. Yeah.